Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Lessons of the Woods by 10 Point Whitetails. Uh, we got a few things that we're going to talk about today, but I suppose I should introduce us. In case you haven't been with us before, my name is Dylan Porter, I'll be your host here. And with me I have Kyle Weber as my co-host. Uh, we got a few things we want to talk about today. We talk a lot of deer hunting stuff, a lot of property management. And one of the topics we're going to cover today, after a few check-ins with how Kyle's doing, we're going to talk about... If I was suddenly DNR commissioner, how would I fix hunting in the state of Minnesota? And then we're going to question Kyle on what he would do in Wisconsin. So we got answers this time. We got not facts, but strong opinions on what we think should be done. Does that sound about right? Yeah, we're, we've complained enough. Now it's time to show what we what we would implement without ridicule and questions and having to go through the right process if it was just we were king of the deer hunting world in the state of minnesota or wisconsin this is what we would do there maybe we we'll have such great ideas we will be appointed or assigned to to this maybe they'll be like them guys got it figured out we need to call them. that would be so. amazing but that's, we both know that's never going to happen oh no absolutely we're not in their click no no, well, we're not part of. We're not in the cool kids club. <laughs> Maybe we're not in that club. Put it that way. Definitely. All the politicians got each other in their pockets. So nice. So, anyway, uh, how are th- how are things been going out at the land? We haven't talked about that for a while, so we gotta check in there real quick. How's the snow treating you? Shed antlers. Uh, we we talked about one buck that's shed. Yep. Um. Well, see, I mean, season for us has been over. I mean, basically since Oct- since Ace Oct- end of October there Halloween. Um, so we've been just kind of watching the ca- watching the cameras, and kind of keeping track. We've had a lot of bucks run through there um, during the rut. Some deer we some deer stayed, some deer left. Um, but as of the last couple of weeks, we've had like the, the biggest change and biggest shift in, in what's going on. Um, in the last two weeks, we've received over 24 inches of snow. Oof. And in the last week, we've received uh, negative temperatures at the negative 15 for a low, uh, wind chills higher than that. And we're seeing a considerable amount of pressure on those deer. So their travel corridors, their tra- their um traveling has really shrunk down the food plots are now covered so they are trying to dig for what's left in there um this is pretty early for this kind of snow and weather so it's if you're worried about deer management on your property this is about as bad as winter can get now i know the snowmobilers are super excited they got great snow and the trails are going to be good once the once the ro- uh, trails are cleared off, but for a deer perspective, the deer are in for a long, hard winter. Um, snow like this gives the predators an advantage. The coyotes, the wolves, the bobcats, they're all going to take advantage and pick apart mm-hmm. uh, the deer herd. The bucks that are ran down and tired haven't had much time to recoup from the rut, so they're struggling, or they can be struggling. We actually have a deer, a small yearling, or you know, a, a nice yearling or a, a small two-year-old that we can't decide if it was a predator attack or if it was a fence issue, but he's got a gaping wound on his leg. Yeah. And um, within two days, I got a picture of him with horns and with picture picture without him. So he dropped early based on that wound, and we did a good TikTok and, and Facebook post about it. You did. Um but I've also seen other deer are shedding. I got I got a lot of half racks going on. So a lot of our two year olds and three or a lot of our yearlings and two year olds are going half racked already. So they're already in survival mode. Um, I know in Minnesota you can feed, feed. Not 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 in the whole state. Parts not in the of the whole, state. But yes. Yep. So in parts of the state you can feed. Um, I would highly recommend to taking advantage of that legal opportunity. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think there's a limit. Where you are allowed to? No, they're normally pretty flexible on that. You can go dump out a uh, dump trailer load of sugar beet tailings or semi load of corn or whatever. They're not that fussy. But uh, seeing that you got deer shedding already, that means your deer are struggling. If you see bucks without antlers at this time of year, 
They are struggling. They're low on food, and they're not even physically able to reproduce at this point. So uh, as I said in the TikTok that we did, when a buck sheds early, it's his body's way of telling him, you, can, you can't chase girls anymore. You need to stop. And they are actually physically unable to have a sperm count at this point. So if your bucks are shedding, they're underfed, they're not doing well, which is something you're trying to fix at wit's end, but that's going to be yeah. a couple of your project yet. Yep. I'm, I'm taking advantage of our baiting law. So in Bayfield County and in the Northern half of the Wisconsin, you can bait two gallons and we'll read the regs in the next podcast. But, um, you, you can, you can put two gallons out at maximum at any point in time. I'm definitely taking advantage of that to give them anything and everything. Um, to give them a chance because mm -hmm. I'm even doing, I'm plowing trails, I'm snow blowing, I'm packing stuff down with snowshoes to give them more opportunities to run through there and not be punching through the snow. Mm -hmm. um, they're going to struggle. This is going to be a bad year if you're worried about deer management. Um, they're dropping the horns and, and a buck can show you. You know, a buck can show you that they're getting smaller, they're shrinking in their neck, they're losing their body mass, they're losing their antlers. Their focus on, is on protecting and rebuilding their body. Those can't show that. Those does are making a baby right now, and they're struggling exactly like a, a buck is. They just don't have antlers to show you that they're struggling. Yeah. So I, if you legally can, I would highly recommend you get out there and um, if you're doing any sort of deer management, uh, give them – in the northern half. Where we're, I mean, we got way more snow than you guys have up in northern Minnesota, but um, they're struggling. I don't know. We got, I think we got about 18 inches, so we're not too far behind you, but we didn't get that 24. So, yeah, well, you're not too far ahead of us. After this weekend, we'll beat you. Yeah, well, you already are ahead of us, but yeah, I wouldn't say way. <laughs> we're gaining right. on you. But. So, um, but so right now we're just, fo I mean, what's ends is we're just focusing on watching the cameras, seeing what deer made it through the rifle season, see what bucks are deciding to stay on the property. Mm -hmm. um, maybe I'm create. I'm hoping to create some residential bucks that stay there um, through next summer into next season and maybe have something to, to target next year. Um, so watching cameras for that, taking advantage of some nutrition for the deer, um, and helping them any way we can with some trails and snowshoeing and packing some of that stuff down. And um, I actually took my side by side and plowed the food plot off um, last weekend uh, just to clear the food plot off, just so they had instead of 24 inches of snow to dig through, they only had like six to dig through. Um, to get down to that food plot that's that's still there. The sh I mean, turnips are in there. We got a bunch of stuff down there that they can eat, but it's a lot of calories to dig through all that just to find it. So I, any help yeah. I can do with that? Absolutely. Um, the one day I actually, what's that? Go ahead. I was actually the one day I pulled up. I pulled up. There was a doe and a fawn out there. I scared her off. Did my work, and I was like parked off the food plot, kind of where we have a we have an entrance for like our tractor and stuff like that. And I was parked off there, and I was on my phone, and I turned around, and she was already back out there, even with a side by side running. Yeah. So she, and that, and to our point with side by sides and four wheelers and, and conditioning these deer, she she's in desperate need of food. She did care about the noise. Um, she did not like when I got out, but uh, anything you can do to help your herd is is priority right now, especially in northern Wisconsin. So yeah, and that's that goes it. to We're, prove a couple of points that I think we made in an earlier podcast. But the more the more the deer are struggling, the more they'll put up with. So I think I told yeah. this story before where we were feeding deer one winter and it was like, you know, you get days 20, 30 below, you can dump out your corn and sit, turn around, sit on the pail and you'll have deer walk up to you because they're that hungry. But once it gets over 20 degrees, they're a lot more comfortable. Uh, and it can be done pretty cheaply. I know you've struggled to find stuff in Wisconsin for putting out, you know, it gets expensive when you're doing it by a 50 pound bag of corn. Uh, but for Minnesota guys, if you go to your local grain elevator and start asking around or call a local sunflower seed company and get their screenings, you can get sunflower screenings for 40 bucks a ton. And that's cheap food. It's good food. Got lots of good fat content to feed your deer all winter. Whether you're putting it out in a two, five gallon pail or two gallons at a time or in Minnesota, you dump it. Uh, but you don't need a ton of equipment. I've seen guys put a tarp down the back of their pickup box bed, go get a ton of screenings or as much as they can get in the box of their pickup and drive home and unload it into dog food bags. You know, so there's options out there for you guys to feed your deer. If, even if you don't have a skid, or you don't have a tractor, you don't have a way to unload this, you know, in large quantities, there's ways to get it. 
uh, instead of paying you know ten bucks per fifty pound bag or whatever it ends up costing when you go to a hardware store or a gas station or whatever. Well, gas stations in Wisconsin sell deer corn, don't they? Yeah, not here. Oh, lumberyards <laughs> sell deer corn. Uh, deer deer corn is almost not a thing in Minnesota because you can't bait deer. You can sure. feed them, but you can't bait them. So there's a few feed supply stores that sell corn, spe- specially attributed for deer, but that gets and really I'd be expensive. Okay with, I'd actually cater to that, whether baiting or feeding. Personally, I think it's more important to feed these deer to get them to survive the winter than it is to bait them and hunt them. Yeah. What we do on the property creates the ability to hunt these deer. I don't, I don't need bait corn pile of corn i don't need that to hunt them i just want them to survive the winter betterment of the herd so if so if, if the dnr i was like okay no more baiting but you're allowed to feed any ton as you want i'd be i'd be very supportive of that because that's more important to me but you know we can get to the bait topic later but yeah um yeah right now cameras deer keeping track of them trying to give them as much as we can helping them on the food plot by clearing it off giving them trails to run on because it's not the cold right deer are well adapted to negative degree weather they're okay with it mm-hmm. i mean you've, you've seen them in probably the harshest conditions you've seen them up close in those conditions but the deep snow hurts them more than anything because of the predator ability and i mean the cold does beat them down i'm not saying it's not if they have that. food they can survive the cold if yes, they don't have food, they'll freeze to death. But the deep snow hurts them whether it's cold or not and whether they have food or not because they just can't – they burn so much energy getting through it. So like you're going out with your snowshoes or even just boots, go clear your trails. Go just do a quick walk You know, after a big snowstorm. You're just going to help your deer out. Plus you'll get some exercise. It's good for most of us guys that get a little bit on the heavier side over the course of the winter anyway. You know, let's let's take care of our deer herd. Yep. Yep. That's, so. so that's where we're at. It's not very eventful. We'll turn in or late spring here. We'll we'll turn into doing some habitat hinge cutting and stuff like that. We'll get some footage of that. But um, right now, it's just kind of document and hang out and hope for no more snow and hope for uh, the deer. Pray for the deer, basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's uh, going to be a rough season for a lot of deer, especially if it stays this cold. I mean, below zero temps already in Minnesota. I don't think we normally see that in December. So that's February. That's February weather for us. This this amount of snow and this temperature is February weather. So I'm slightly terrified, but Oof. Um, you know, could be could be worse. Could be like Buffalo. You get like 70 inches in one dump. So yes, that would probably ruin everything. So yeah. But moving on to our next topic here, we're going to talk more about baiting and different stuff like that next time. But. So now we're going to give us give out solutions for a top-down management strategy where the DNR actually give a darn about the de- white-tailed deer in both Minnesota and Wisconsin and what we would do if we were given power to make the decisions. If we were king of Minnesota and, and Wisconsin and full control over the deer herd, this is what we would do. And if you don't like it, too bad because it ain't going to happen anyway. It might not be fun, but... You can't argue that it would most likely work, right? Don't don't hate us. Don't this hate us. This is purely being selfish this on is, our part. Yes. Um, what we think would work, and it's very, it's I mean, it's dramatic. It's drastic changes. It's not. There's no. There's no easing into this. But uh, yeah, don't hate us for this. But it. At the end of the day, we want what. Good hunting, tradition, maybe some trophy whitetails. I think Not both of our topics. Tails. Mature whitetails. Mature whitetails. Mature bucks, both, mature both does. Our, yep. Are both our topic, are both our solutions, is it focused on just shooting the biggest animal and breaking the next world record? It's a general herd management that allows us to have a good, enjoyable hunting experience. Right? Yep. I agree. So would you like me to go first? Because I think yours is going to raise Mine's significantly longer. Yeah, it's definitely going to have some pitchforks and torches. So do you want to go first? Yeah, I think uh, let me go first. Okay. All right, paint the picture for me. Where? What am I doing? Where am I at? Uh, you get given the power to control 
the entire state of Wisconsin's whitetail deer herd. You get the choice. You get to decide how the sections are divvied up, whether it's by county, whether it's by section. Uh, maybe you even move to, I don't know where your state capital is. Is your state capital Green Bay? Does that sound Madison. right? Madison. Madison. Whatever. I don't know. I'm in Minnesota. I don't care. I'm in Green Bay because we have the most titles. 13. Psh, psh, psh. We're not talking about that today. <laughs> you move to Madison. You get a big house. And you get all the all of Wisconsin's resources at your fingertips, which is a lot. And we'll talk. We should maybe talk about that at some point before we're done with this particular episode. Uh, you get access to the Wisconsin DNR's one point one billion dollar budget. What are you gonna do? All right. So my focus is something that the DNR currently pitch tradition. Deer hunting, hunting the nine day rifle season is considered tradition in northern Wisconsin. Yeah, it's, I'm pretty sure it's the whole way across the state. Okay? So, I mean, it is tradition, tradition, tradition. They paint that, they push that, and I think they've lost it. But my first day in office, this is what I want to do, and I'm reading my notes here, so that's why I'm <laughs> – if I get out of screen, just, just let me get back. All right. So something that Montana does, you get one tag. So in Montana, it's either species – White tail or mule deer, either sex, buck or a doe. You get one tag though. You you are harvesting one animal. I would immediately implement one animal per license. So on, on September first, you buy your license, you get one tag. That will benefit everyone in this way. Nobody will overharvest. So you can't, you know. Right now, I can shoot a buck with my bow, a buck with my rifle. And I mean that's two, and I rarely, I've, I don't think I've ever done it. Maybe no, I did last year. I had a great opportunity to shoot a deer first time on the land, and I shot a buck with my son first time he's ever sat with me. I'm not passing that up. But I rarely shoot to, to fill two tags. Mm -hmm. But one tag, buck or doe. The trophy hunters shoot a buck, hunt all season with your bow, your crossbow, your rifle, your muzzleloader. Hunt all season. To shoot your target, your you know your your buck, whether it's a spike or a two hundred inch whitetail, that's what you you can target that. If you're a meat hunter, which a lot of people are, fill your doe tag, shoot it, fill it. There you go. There's your meat. Fill your freezer. A family of four puts four deer in the freezer. That's a lot. I mean, it's mm -hmm. not. Some people eat a lot more, but that's that's a lot. That's a lot of animal. All right. On the buck side of things. I would implement for three years, don't hang me for this, a four-point restriction, points restriction. There is solid evidence that I believe that a point restriction is not healthy for a deer herd because your one-year-old or two-year-olds that provide four points are genetically superior than your spikes or your forks. So you're still shooting that yearling at four points that produces four points on one side. But... My goal with this being only three years, it passes your yearling spikes, your two-year-old forks and sixes, and gets your age structure up. Your ones, your twos, automatically, I, I'm going to say our genetics are inferior up here, up in on the northern half. Um, so the spikes, the forks, and the sixes get a pass to the next year because of this four-point restriction. But after three years, our age structure will be fives and you know five down to three we'll have those three four five year old bucks which we don't have right now or very few of them so four points on one side point restriction for three years only then we eliminate that because it is not healthy for a uh, trophy management style it, it, it is going to hinder them um with the point restrictions a first time hunter so a young person or somebody that purchases their license for the first time via the DNR, or anyone under the age of 18. No point restriction. I want that child or that first-time hunter to go out there and be able to successfully harvest an animal, get the buck fever, get the doe fever, get the rush, have a successful hunt, and basically get the hook in them to be like, this was an awesome experience, I want to do it more. So a 60-year-old man or woman that buys her license for the first time to shoot a deer, no points restriction. Shoot a spike. I want you to have success. Um, anybody end of the age of 18. So even if you hunt at 12, you can hunt from 12 to 18 or 12 to 17. 
You can shoot spikes the whole time. I don't care. Once you turn 18, you have to follow the points restriction. In this case, if you're 12, the points restriction will be over by the time you're 18, so you won't have to worry about it anyways. Mm -hmm. But, yes, uh, first-time hunter, under the age of 18, no points restriction. Um, special population hunting. There are specific areas by me, and I can like draw a very small circle in this, these areas, and it's mostly ag or um, big national forest areas that are overpopulated with does. So what I would recommend, and I would need information on this, so obviously that 1.1 billion dollars would come in handy, but find out these hot spots where these doe populations are considerably more. And if it's private land, you hand out doe tags to the farmers free of charge or for, you know, I, I would say free of charge. You give them doe tags. They can transfer them to a, a hunter as long as it's on their property. So if I'm a farmer, I get five doe tags plus the doe tag or plus the deer tag I have. But if if Dylan comes to my farm and says I want to hunt on your property, you go here. You sign you sign the tag. They you I sign the tag. You sign the tag, and then you're allowed to hunt on my property and harvest the doe. That way, the meat hunter can maybe harvest two animals. Mm -hmm. The trophy hunter can harvest a buck and shoot a doe, and it also in these these overpopulated spots will hopefully knock it down. Now, National Forest, there's 20, there's 12,000 acres right right by Drummond, where uh, between Cable and Drummond. So if we know there's an overpopulation of does there, which there isn't, but if we know there is, we can go National Forest between this road and this road, this road and this road, we're going to give an excess extra 750 doe tags out. And Joe Blow from Green Bay or Madison can apply for that doe tag and maybe get it and hunt public property. But that's how we would do spot hunting. And when, once the doe populations are controlled in them areas, we pull them. So once the population seems under control, mm -hmm. we pull them and then that's no longer a thing. Montana changes it all the time. Every, the map is different every year. Special permits are issued every year in different spots. I mean, it's they, they really work hard to hunt where it's overpopulated and stay out of where it's underpopulated yeah so special population hunting for extra doe tags open to the public national forest open to farmers and transferable to hunters um let's see here crossbows dun 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 <laughs> i don't care how you hunt if you hunt legal legally and follow the regulations and you make a good ethical harvest. I don't care what weapon you use. But I believe if you're using a weapon that can be loaded and to use it you pull a trigger and you have a magnified scope, I wouldn't consider you an archery hunter. I, there I said it. So crossbows have a huge advantage over a bow hunter. It's just what happens. It's just, it is what it is. So I would implement a two week, so 14 days, um, crossbow season at the end of September. So bow season starts on like the 7th, 10th, 12th, whatever that weekend lands. The crossbow is at the end of the two weeks. So maybe the last week of September and the first week of October. And then once you're done with your crossbow, you have to put it away. It's the same thing as muzzleloader. It's the same thing as rifle. It's, it's its own specific thing. Obviously, bow hunting, you can hunt through the whole thing. You just have to follow. During rifle season, you have to hunt with orange. Um, muzzle loader, you have to hunt with orange. And then any antlerless hunt, you have to, you can't harvest the buck with your bow during an antlerless weekend. But two weeks for the crossbow. There, I said it. People can be mad for that. Um, National forest, and I talked about this. In specific national forest uh, areas, we need to regulate the tags that can go there. So like I said, in Montana, they do these special permitting areas. We can circle these national forests and go 200 tags here, 500 tags here, 1,000 tags here. Based on information that we get from our $1.1 billion, you know, mm -hmm. we can do just, we can basically use a drone and count the deer. But... <laughs> Um, 
and you can improve these national forests, like this public chunk of public land, you can't hunt it without the special permit. And we would definitely worry about, work on that. We would definitely, you know, let less deer permits in this one to increase the age structure, to increase the deer herd. And then once we feel it's good at, to a good point, you, you let a lot, bunch of hunters in there and they experience a good hunt. Um, so I would pick those national forest sections apart and really delegate what permits or what deer, deer hunting can be done in there. Right now it's a free for all. Mm -hmm. It's public land. If you have a license, hunt well I, there's not a lot of deer in public land let's put it that way so um we get into tradition when i was 12 years old maybe 14 i don't remember i shot my first buck with my dad it was an eight pointer similar to this guy right here nothing to brag about but it was my first year i was happier than a clam we drove into a holiday station it was a registration station so you take your back tag off, you open your thing, the tag's on the deer, you go in, you fill out a form, mm -hmm. okay? You give it to the guy that's working behind the desk for the DNR, he grabs a metal tag, he takes your thing, your metal tag, and he walks out to your deer. He looks at the deer. He inspects the deer. When he thinks everything's good, he puts the metal tag on it. You are now registered. It was a great time because that guy got to inspect is there a bullet hole during archery season and i'm talking just the nine day gun season i mean when it's when there's an influx of hunting um but there's you get to inspect it why is there a bullet hole if you said you shot it with your archery why did you say you shot it this morning if the eyes are sunk in it's been dead for a week like you can question the mm -hmm. legality the legal ver you know um so that i want to i want the stations again and i know things are electronic so we still can do that but having that there as a, a registration station is important because I remember sitting there with my buck and all these guys walking by and they go first time, first buck. And I'm like, yeah. And they're like, great job. That's a nice buck. Congratulations. Good. Shaking my hand. Mm -hmm. Like I'm a hero, but I felt like a man. I felt like part of the, part of that group. I successfully did it. And then as you walk down the tailgates and you see these deer that are, you're like, Oh, someday. Oh, that was out there. And mm -hmm. it, it builds that tradition. Um, that was a big traditional part. They still have all the back tags for the years that they issued them. You know, the big it was big green. It went on your back. You had your number on it. Mm -hmm. Like, still have those. Now it's, I mean, you shoot a deer, you could have it hung, butchered, quartered, processed, and the deer on the wall in 12 hours and not even tell anybody you shot it. I mean, because it's online. It's one click. Mm -hmm. So I would bring back the registration stations. I personally feel that is really important and it really built a community towards deer hunting. Now, archery, yeah. we'd have to talk about something else. We'd have to figure out a different way to do it because you're not going to have a guy at the gas station every time. But you should. We, I think we need to do that again. Um, we're going to talk about – this is long-winded. Holy buckets. <laughs> um Next podcast, we're going to talk about baiting regulations. And we're going to pick it apart really fun like. But I did some research about Ohio, and I want to follow their thing because there's a big argument of baiting. I don't care. Get rid of baiting as long as I can feed them. Save the deer herd. That's what I really want. Mm -hmm. But once you bait, you almost need to bait everywhere because it changes the deer so much mm -hmm. around here. Corn pile, corn pile, corn pile, corn pile. You know, but baiting on private land only, mm. not on public. Now I was going to say that gives the private people an advantage. Yeah, but we own land. You already have an advantage. We, we pay taxes on it. We can build food plots. Now, food plots do not count as baiting. Food plots do not count as baiting. Food plots have an entire different beneficial factor to the woods, to the nature than a corn pile. But I would agree for baiting, you're allowed to bait on private property. TBD on the next podcast on the volume, the amount. But I'm going to say today, if I'm DNR commissioner, uh, baiting on private land is legal. Baiting on public land is illegal. Um, 
and I'm sure there's a bunch of little stuff through the rule book I could pick apart and change, but them are the majors. We're talking big picture here. I'm talking big. One buck tag or doe, or one one tag, one deer you get to harvest, three year four points um, minimum, crossbow season implemented, specific special population hunts, both on national forest and on uh, agriculture and, and um, overpopulated areas, um, and registration stations. That's kind of the biggest things on that topic. So if I was DNR commissioner, that's where we'd start. If nobody could tell me no, if I could just do what I want. <laughs> and but. that's the big one. Nobody can tell you no. Yes. Yeah. There will be people imagine? that want to tell you no. Yep. Yep. But we would have, the, so what this gains us, so let's, so all of those changes. Now let's talk about it for a minute. If we do that, if we do what I did, we've just bumped the age structure up from ones, twos, and threes mm -hmm. to twos, threes, fours, and fives. Now you get rid of the antler restriction, but that doesn't matter because if you're a trophy hunter, if you're hunting for antlers, and you have a trail camera photo of a 160-inch 10-pointer, it's really easy to pass on the fork, on the little 8 that's a 2-year-old, the 10 that's a 2-year-old. It's super easy because you're mm -hmm. like, big He's hoss is over here. So all I need to do is get that age structure up to get better deer, and you will naturally start passing on the smaller ones. And you'll basically be doing a point restriction on yourself. Mm -hmm. And then now that 10-pointer that's a year old, he's this big, but he's a 10. You're like, I'm not going to touch him. There's bigger ones to shoot. And then he breeds, and then he gets to mature, and then he breeds. And that age structure is super important. So that's what that goal is. And obviously not over-harvesting. That's mm -hmm. why we go to one tag. Yeah. Okay? I don't know how many people do two tags or three or shoot for their wife or shoot for their kids. Because we're allowed to party hunt here. Mm -hmm. But um, we're trying to get that age structure up and try to balance the population. And that involves, you drive through some of these areas and it's just does in the fields. Does, does, does. Well, if no, everybody's passing the does and shooting bucks, you're going to have a really bad doe to buck ratio. Yeah. But in five years, five years with what I just did, just these simple things, man, uh, minus 48 inches of snow, and it's a freezing cold, your deer herd would be really good. Yeah. Anywhere in the state. Anywhere in the state would be phenomenal. So. Oh, yeah. I think that you made some very good points there, and I think that would work quite well. Uh, for Minnesota, I do it a little bit differently, or a lot differently in some area, some ways. But I do think that that would, that would work. And Minnesota and Wisconsin have the largest budgets that I know of for a game and fish or a DNR agency. Uh, I'll throw those numbers out real quick. Just so people get an idea, right? Because you don't know how big your budget is to so compare it to something else. So we have the resources in Minnesota and Wisconsin to do what we're talking about. But the money gets spent on, well, all the agents got to have new pickups. We got to have special agents that don't really have a job, but they're supposed to do this, you know, type of thing where they like go count flowers and butterflies and get paid $90,000 a year to do it. There's better ways to do these things. Okay, I'm not saying some people don't deserve to get paid, but there's just some jobs don't need to be there. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right? I mean, they're working for the town, I'm a town supervisor. You're given this much money, you have to make it work. Mm -hmm. So shedding the fat is a yearly tactic. Every year we get to the budget, it's like shed the fat. And you'd love to give the money to everybody, but you can't. In our instance, you can't. Yeah. The DNR it seems like they they don't find get more people to give money to. Yes. Yep. They need more money every so, year. I want to talk about the budget thing. I know in some instances people are like we and I'm not saying our my my town supervisor deal, but I've heard people that have to report a budget. We need fifty thousand dollars this year. We need a million dollars this year. Let's just say somebody requests a million dollars for their budget, for their for their organization, for their department. They they need a million, mm -hmm. and it gets to the first of December, and they've only spent seven hundred. They'll literally go, "I need to spend the rest of this three hundred thousand because if I only spend seven fifty, they won't give me a million next year. They'll give me seven fifty. So we need to mm -hmm. spend it, so it looks like we needed it in our budget, so we can ask for more. So when you're saying 
find somebody to give the money to. That's literally what they're trying to do. They're like, mm-hmm. we could probably do this for like six hundred million, but we're gonna spend one point two billion every time so that we can keep asking for. It. Oh yeah. And then we're gonna ask for more. And then they find so. problems like CWD, and we're gonna have a CWD talk at some point. We're gonna talk a little bit about that next episode, but we're gonna have an actual CWD talk, and I'd love to get Dad on board for that one. Uh, also, fake. <clears throat> huh? Fake. Oh yeah, <clears throat> CWD's fake. Uh, yeah. So we're gonna have some fun with that. There's a lot of things to do there. Uh, so the budget thing, real quick, just so we know, Minnesota, Wisconsin can do this, okay? And I'm comparing. Budget to budget with four states, and I'm comparing acres to four states because I can't. I didn't t- have time to come up with. Okay, what's the deer herd like? What's the h- human population like? What? How many people are in each office? Uh, that's just not information that I have at my fingertips. Acreage is really easy to do. Okay, so we're gonna compare Minnesota, Wisconsin, Texas, and South Dakota. Texas has a great deer program. South Dakota has a great deer program, or program in general. So state with the highest budget of those four is Minnesota with 1.2 billion dollars for the Minnesota DNR. 1.2 billion. It's ridiculous. Wisconsin, 1.1 billion. Texas, 610 million. 610 million. Why is Minnesota and Wisconsin double of that? South Dakota, 56 million dollar budget 56 million dollar budget that's that's a fifth uh, uh not a fifth that's five percent roughly right yeah. right yes. in there why is that so low okay now if we compare acres okay largest state obviously is Wisconsin, is texas 171 million acres in texas so they're spending $610 million to manage 171 million acres. In Minnesota, they are spending $1.2 billion to manage 56 million acres. We are less than a third, right about a third, of Texas's size. And our budget is a little over double, or right about double. Explain that to me, people. Explain that. That doesn't make sense. Wisconsin, I will hit South Dakota first. South Dakota is smaller yet, has 49, 49,354,240 and acres. And their budget is 56 million. That's just over a million dollars per acre. Per, it's actually, it adds up pretty close. Not a million dollars per acre. That's not right. But it's, I mean, we're almost at dollars to donuts there, right? 56 million dollars, 49 million acres. We're right there. It all lines up. Wisconsin is the smallest state of the four with 34,800,000 acres and yet the second highest budget of $1.1 billion. Why can South Dakota and Texas do it on such a much lower budget? Is it because Minnesota, like we were just saying in Wisconsin, they find people to give the money to. They find problems. They find CWD needs to be managed. We got to bring in snipers. We got to bring in helicopters. We got to bring in feed stations and spend all this money fighting a disease that doesn't really exist. Well, it exists. It does exist, but it's blown out of proportion similar to a certain C19 disease a few years ago. Okay? The original reports for that one said that everybody's going to die. And was it like less than 1% of people who got it died? I think less than the standard flu. Yeah. So, is things blown out of proportion? If you want to make money, you come up with a problem that only you can solve. Right? It's really easy for me to be like, Kyle, your house is going to get struck by lightning one day, and only I can solve it. You have to buy this insurance policy and this thing from me, and only I can solve it. Or it's not even lightning. It's going to get struck by some magical rainbow thunderbolt thing that doesn't exist. But only I can solve it. Nobody else can. Well, if you, and I'm not going to solve it. No, I, it's not about solving it. I can figure out how to stop it eventually. I'm going to work on figuring out the way to make it not hit your house. Yeah. Well, if they if, haven't if solved I was, anything, if I was convincing enough, you'd spend a lot of money 
for me to protect your house and your wife and your kids. Yep. Is that what's happening, people? Come on. So, the budget's here. Minnesota makes the Minnesota DNR make money from the Minnesota State Lottery. That's where a large portion of their budget comes from. We get money from the lottery to run our DNR in Minnesota. Did you know that, Kyle? No. Yeah, the Minnesota State Lottery, if you ever come into Minnesota and buy a lottery ticket, a certain amount of that proceeds goes straight to the Minnesota DNR. I think we're probably the only one in the U.S. that's funded by the lottery. Huh. Makes no sense at all. Anyway, we heard Kyle's plan if he was DNR commissioner of Wisconsin. Now, we're going to make more people angry, right? If we haven't made anybody angry yet. Mine's pretty... Uh timid compared to yours and i've only heard so i'm actually going to hear this basically for the full time first time full through i've heard some things and my jaw dropped so if you're listening and or watching hold on to your shorts this has been in the i've I've developed this plan over the last several years so some things i've adjusted originally when i came up with this plan my personal deer hunting population was really low, and I didn't know anybody in the state of Minnesota that was happy with their deer population. We'd go around and talk to – I'd talk to 100,000 hunters a year at different events, and they'd all say, nope, there's no deer here, there's no deer here, there's no deer here. So at that time, my plan was I'm DNR commissioner, no deer hunting in the state of Minnesota for a year. Now, that would make a lot of people really angry. But this year – Certain areas have good deer population. So this would have to be reevaluated for the population in your area. So we'd immediately take some of this budget and either hire people to work alongside the counties or hire people within the counties and turn over to a county-based system. And say, okay, you're in charge of your county. How many deer do you think you can have in your county be harvested? And where? Some sides of the county are better than others. But the people in the county know better than the DNR officers or the DNR commissioner. So, year one, based on your area, limited number of tags or even no tags. Now, no tags is going to make some people really mad. But those of you guys hunting like Grand Rapids, Bemidji area, you're not seeing any deer. You sat nine days of rifle season and saw two deer. Ask yourself, why would the DNR sell you tags for deer that don't exist? Right? If they're not there, you're not seeing them. Why are we selling you tags? Because we want the money. So if you don't have enough deer population, we're not selling you tags. Sorry. Not doing it. But we got other benefits coming forward, okay? So it's going to be a county-by-county basis of how many deer can be harvested in each location. Sounds pretty fair so far, right? This is where it gets more fun. For those of you that are in the areas where there's no deer, obviously a wolf season has to be implemented. Has to be done. And I don't know what the legality is of getting them federally delisted. I believe there is some control given to the states because our governor in Minnesota said no wolf season while he's here for four years. So that means he's not going to push for it, which means that he has the ability to push for it. There's a way to do it, even though they're still on the federal protection list in most areas. So we have the ability to get a wolf season. Yes. <laughs> teacher? Yes. Teacher? Yep. yep. They're on the federal protection list but you can hunt them in montana you can hunt them in canada but canada there are, doesn't count there are there are wolf hunts in the state of united the united states of america mm -hmm. even though it's federally protected they're so. federally protected but not protected by the states unless the states choose so yep. states supersede federal to some extent yep. that's how i Just understand the, it so I anybody that's anybody that's listening and says well it's federally protected you can't hunt a wolf there's hunts they do mm -hmm. it states can hunt wolves so just, just nipping that in the butt. It actually is happening. It can happen. There's ways to do it. Okay? So we're going to delist the wolves. We're going to hunt wolves in Minnesota under this plan. We're also going to have a coyote incentive program. If a young person or an adult wants to go out and hunt coyotes, we're going to have a way to – I don't have all the details ironed out, but if you mail us the tail or the ears or whatever, you get – 20 bucks, right? Cover your shipping, get a little bit of money. It's better than gophers. So 20 bucks, okay? Great, people will be happy with that, I hope. Or if they're not, we raise the price. 
We'll figure it out. Okay? You got 1.2 to spend. Yeah. 40 bucks a, a coyote. Doesn't matter. Guys, we're doing it for 60 dollars. bucks for just the... Fr- exactly. Let's kill the coyotes. Not all of them. Yes, we need some, but we got to trim some fat here. We got to get rid of some numbers of coyotes. We got to rid of some numbers of wolves. If our focus is truly to have a healthy deer herd. Okay? Then, tag priority. So in, if your zone gets tags, your county, landowners first. They are the main priority for getting deer licenses. Okay? Landowners need to get their tag first. They own the land. They're paying taxes on it. Then, residents of the state are next in line to get tags. And then, out-of-state or out-of-state hunters are third, which that means, let's say, your county has a thousand tags. Okay? Landowners, you get your tag first. Out-of-state people or in-state people that want to hunt in that county that don't own land or live in that county and live in an apartment, you get your tag second. It's, now, if we still have tags left over, now we can make them available to out of state. But even if we end up with a lottery system, let's say the landowners, your lottery, your you get three points for the lottery, in-state residents get two points, and out of state get one. And those be cumulative like other states like North Dakota, Montana, where your points are cumulative towards getting your license. So. Eventually, you will get a license with those preference points, is what they call them, right? Am I making sense so far? Yep. I I have one question. Okay. To the landowner thing. If I own my land, my name's on my name is on my land. Mm-hmm. What about my kids? That's going to be have to be determined how many deer are available, and. So they would be a, a state resident. They would not be a landowner. That would be something that we'd have to figure out, but it would be you guys would be the preferred customers here, right? And we're talking when you when you say this, not to critique yours. You didn't say a word on mine, so I appreciate that. But you're saying yours is very drastic, in, in my opinion. There's so, some areas where it has to be because we don't have the deer. Right, but like you're saying, you know, how many how many hunter hunting licenses last year? Six hundred. What, what was it? It was like. It was it was nearly a million licenses sold or something dumb eight hundred thousand, and they filled like thirty percent. Thirty percent of them are being filled. So we're, when we're talking about issuing tags for Minnesota, we're not talking three hundred tags. We're talking three hundred thousand tags. Mm-hmm. So most likely, every property owner should get, a, get a, tag. a tag or more every state resident is going to get a tag it's when you get to the non-resident that it will be a potential lottery system yeah and if your area doesn't have enough deer like certain parts of the uh grand rapids area that don't have enough deer that's where we'd have to implement a lottery for the whole area for everybody but that's where your landowner you get three preference points when you sign up your resident you get two preference points you're out of state you get one good luck Hopefully you get a tag. That way there's still an opportunity for people to get a tag, but you're not guaranteed a tag just because we don't have the deer. Once that deer population comes up, this is this part's going to go away, right? Okay. Tag prices increase to match uh, the outlying states. Okay. And most of the time outlying, outlying, outlying states will all, or people coming from out of state will almost always be a raffle or a draw unless we got tons of deer. So... If you want to hunt in Minnesota right now from out of state, it's like 120 bucks. If you want to hunt in North Dakota from out of state, it's significantly more expensive. I think it's 240, double. Why? They have, I mean, they have the same deer. They're right across. They're 30 miles from me. Why are their deer worth more than my deer? They have a lower budget. I couldn't find their budget. But why are their deer worth more than my deer? Doesn't make any sense. So instead, we're going to try to value quality over quantity is where we want to get to, right? Quality of harvest versus quantity of harvest. Okay. If your area allows two tags per person, it's, that would be a buck and a doe. If you're going to get your, and when I'm saying most of the time, these tags are almost always buck tags, unless we have very bad buck to doe ratio, but almost always buck tags, just because that's how the state of Minnesota is and always has been. If you're in an area with high, with a higher doe population, it's going to be earn a buck. You gotta shoot your doe first, you gotta register it before you can harvest your buck. Cause that way you're sitting, you might see a buck, just allows different things. Okay. 
And I might even say across the whole state, no bucks in year one. But we'll see. Also, but you said no, no hunting year one. If there's in the areas where there is hunting, maybe no bucks. Okay. Yeah, but yes, this is gonna make a lot of people mad at me. But I'm the DNR commissioner. Why do I care? That you've been assigned. I'm assigned to the position. I don't lose my job. I get to work here for four years, so I get four years to decide. Hey, is this gonna work? Because the only person I have to worry about pissing off is the governor. <laughs> I have one person who's in charge of me. One. And if I'm drinking buddies with them, what's going to happen? Just where his house is. Yeah, right? Okay. Year two, if population allows, earn a buck across the entire state. Easy to do. Shoot a doe, shoot a buck. Earn a buck. And ideally at the beginning of this program, before you buy your license every year, you have to have a... You have to read a pamphlet or sign a paper or something that says you understand how to tell the age of a whitetail buck on the hoof, whether it's a short YouTube video, whatever, okay? I'm talking a three-minute thing. This is what a yearling looks like. This is what a two-year-old looks like. This is what a three-and-up looks like because we're, now we're making an educated decision. I'm not doing an APR because I don't necessarily agree with them very much because of reasons that Kyle stated. I just don't feel like it's the best thing for the herd, okay? Also, once you hit that earn a buck, yeah, we got that. So, if population allows, we're going to do earn a buck across the entire state, and we're going to reevaluate the coyote incentive. We got to check our coyote levels. If there's no coyotes left, then we did something wrong. Okay, we do have to be careful with some of these things. I understand how the—that's the word. Now I can't even remember the word. Ecosystem works. You got to have, you got to have predators. You got to have deer, whatever. But we don't need quite so many predators if we want more deer. We have to figure out that balance. So we're going to reevaluate every year. This is not set in stone. This is a year by year plan. Only two changes in year two. We're going to reevaluate the deer populations, maybe do earn a buck for the whole state, reevaluate the coyote population, figure that out, and probably continue to have a wolf wolf hunt. Year three, earn a buck should be avail available across the whole state at this point, mm -hmm. and also reevaluate both the predator levels again and make sure we're happy with everything there. So, what this does in year one, we have less deer harvested, which allows for population growth. So those of you that aren't seeing any deer, we're allowing your population to grow. You're going to start seeing deer, which is what we all want. We at the very least want to see deer while we're hunting. Even within a half hour of me, I had a lot of people say, yeah, we didn't see any deer. We didn't see any deer. We saw two deer all season. With, but I, could, I can drive from here to my dad's place and see 170 deer in the winter now. Why are people a half hour away not seeing deer? Doesn't make any sense. Something's off. The deer population's messed up. We gotta iron this out. Okay. Earn a buck or does only allows the bucks to mature. Cause same thing like you were saying. If it's does only, well, you're gonna your bucks aren't gonna get shot. It's not gonna happen. Earn a buck. You have to go hunt. Shoot your doe. Register it before you can buy your buck tag or validate your buck tag. Which means you might see bucks. And if you see a 170, you're like, man, I saw a 170. You walked right by my stand. You're not going to go shoot the first spike buck you see on your next set. You're just not going to do it. Okay? Year two, you're going to start seeing larger bucks. Earn a buck deters harvest of yearlings, which we just discussed. By year three, under this program, we should be seeing at the bare minimum three-year-old bucks, if not four- and five-year-old bucks. So it's a three-year plan, just changing the amounts of deer harvested and changing the predator levels harvested. Because right now in Minnesota, there's no incentive to shoot coyotes other than fun. There's no um, there's no value in the hides anymore, so people don't want to do it. There's just no value to it because nobody wants to skin them. I think they're worth 30 40 bucks a piece. They used to be worth 80 bucks a piece. Well, if you shot 100 coyotes over the course of winter, that's pretty good money, you know but it's just not there anymore. So we have to figure out an incentive for these things to happen or we're going to be overrun by coyotes. Um, other, another, one last thing I would do, I'd push the deer season back two weeks. Push rifle season back two weeks. Right now in Minnesota, most areas you get one buck and one doe or just a buck or a buck and a couple does depending on the area. But that's one buck, whether you're doing bow, rifle, or muzzle or all three, it's one buck. Where Wisconsin, if I understand correctly, you can shoot one with your bow and you can shoot one with your rifle. 
which doesn't make any sense because you have zero deer where you're hunting and you can still shoot two deer. I don't understand it. Makes no sense to me whatsoever. I can't stand it. We don't have very, we have lots of deer in some places. We don't have deer in other places. We still can't shoot as many deer as you. Doesn't make any sense. But by pushing the deer season back two weeks, what that does, and people hate this idea because they say it's tradition, but it's not tradition. Back in the 70s, our deer season was the same week as Wisconsin's. I want our deer season to be the same week as Wisconsin's for one reason and one reason only. We allow the bucks to do what they're supposed to do and fight and kill each other for the right to breed a doe. Because opening weekend of deer season, I think it's like 50% of hunters are successful, which that means a large majority of our bucks are being shot three days before the rut. Minnesota deer season always falls where the rut is normally Wednesday through Friday. So we get two days, we get the weekend, then we get Monday and Tuesday, we have four days of hunting, and now the rut kicks in, and then we have two days, we have the last five days of the season is the rut. If we push that back two weeks, they get all their breeding done. Now the biggest bucks with the best genetics, the strongest genetics, the most ability to survive, not even antler size, the most ability to survive, have bred the does, and now they're passing on those stronger genetics. Instead of, well, gee, opening morning, we all, in our group, we shot 10 two-year-old bucks over a, last, over a mile square, so all the yearling bucks get to go breed all the does with unproven genetics. We want the proven genetics to breed the does. And it was like, oh, it's too cold. Bullshit. This is the coldest December we've ever had, and there's still people out muzzleloading right now. Everybody's got a heated stand. We sell heated stands. Call us. We'll hook you up. They're well, not that we, hard we to get sell. a hold of. We sell stands that you have to heat, but we sell in closed blinds. They're not hard to get. This isn't rocket science. They're maybe not muzzling right now because I don't know when that season ended because I didn't partake in it this year, but they're bow hunting. I saw a guy posing with a deer he shot today. It was five below. Yep. Are we really that weak, Minnesota, where we're going to let Wisconsin be tougher than us and hunt when it's colder? Come on. Where's your pride, man? Push it back a week, two weeks, and we're going to hunt in 10 degrees colder weather. Our meat's going to be better because it's not going to sit in 60, 70 degree temps. We're going to waste less deer. And yeah, we might use a little more propane. Big whoop. Okay, am I crazy, or do you think that this might work? Well, I definitely think the management side of it for the deer herd will work, 100%. I just think they would have you hung out in Capitol, Capitol Square. <laughs> um, I, I, I worry about either no hunting or no tags or no buck tags. And this will be. It this is where they're going to argue. Evaluated, and I would have yep. to have a research team to back it all up. This is just me thinking out loud. Because yep. I know there's areas where there's not enough deer. Yes, and and like but how you are, other, how there's other areas where there's plenty of deer. Yeah, and we w both of our goals when we talk about special permitting areas, tags or no tags or no hunting bucks only, we want to even that out. There is no reason why one person could sit and see fifty does and one buck, the next person sits nine days straight and doesn't see a deer. Like that's not healthy. And I, I understand, you know, if your property's on a river, on a river creek, you know, on a, on a river creek. Sure. <sighs> you got special rivers out there in Wisconsin. We know. If you got property next to a river or a creek or something that's more suitable for a deer population, you're going to see more deer. I, I understand that. But when you walk into the National Forest and you don't see a deer sign, you're, it just, it's just empty that's a huge problem mm -hmm. so and like you're saying you can drive from your house to your dad's house 170 deer but if you drive from your house to carlstead or or, or Thief, yeah, if wherever, I drive whatever, north if i drive south here i see next to nothing north i'll see stuff in patches but if i drive over by hallock apparently there's been no deer up this up there this year uh yeah. i talked to some people a half hour south of me that three separate groups of hunting about a four mile square three separate groups in this square all said they didn't see any deer all season. 
and and it's it's a trickle down effect. That person might not buy a license next year, mm-hmm. might not hunt next year, might not get their kids involved. You know, me and Flynn, my son, sat last year. We seen a buck walked in. I took advantage of that opportunity opportunity to show him what a harvest feels like. Mm-hmm. He loved it. We sat this year. He didn't see a deer. He walked out and he's like, "Well, that sucks." Mm-hmm. Yeah, but that's hunting, buddy. Yep. And it's going to be a lot more of those sits rather than the sit from last year. You know, ten sits like what we just experienced to one like last year. It's just part of it. Mm-hmm. Um, but if if Flynn never sees a deer get harvested or never hunts, he's not going to want to go out there with me to see nothing. So, the DNR in having mismanagement of this sort is literally hanging themselves the the licenses are slowly slowly getting sold for less i mean less licenses are being sold the market's down the sport in itself has become have a tv show have a podcast (laughs) and anybody that does a tv show or a podcast hauls their butt to kansas ohio kentucky they're out of here. Nobody wants They're to hunt in Minnesota and Wisconsin. No. Nobody wants to hunt here. Other than Buffalo oh. County. Nobody's coming here as a destination hunt. They're coming here like, oh, well, I could use 40 pounds of meat, so whatever. Yeah. Or yep. my family lives here, so that's where I hunt. But nobody's saying, oh, man, I'm recording a TV show or a podcast or filming my own hunts. I definitely got to go hunt in northern Wisconsin. Absolutely got to go there we, right now. Hunt that we national We are the forest. only ones. We are the only ones that are crazy enough to be like, hey, we're going to have a podcast, a business. Uh, out to, we're going to be in the hunting industry in the worst two places mm-hmm. to have deer hunting. I mean, I post a picture of me and Ace, and nobody's impressed. No. Nobody's impressed. Not on a but, national scale. Uh, yeah, I've, that video is going to come up. People are going to be like, well, he's pretty excited about a little eight-pointer that's not that big in any way, shape, or form. And I'm going to be like... That's the biggest deer on the property. Yep. So, um, yeah, we need to do a lot. And, and, and the DNR are mismanaging it. They have been for a long, long time. And they're going to hang themselves. I mean, the hunting the hunting sport of hunting is slowly dwindling away. Here's the question we got to ask, okay? So under, under my plan, certain areas definitely wouldn't get a, to hunt for the first year. But you got to ask yourself, as a sportsman and as somebody who wants to see this tradition continue, are you willing to give up a year of hunting to better hunt to make your make the hunting better for your children, for future generations? Are you willing to give up a year? I would say ninety-five percent of people are going to say yes. If you took every single person in Minnesota that said, I didn't see a deer, or I only seen one deer, and they didn't hunt next year? Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, if you just... Dis- they basically didn't hunt this year. So we're just asking yeah, them to right. not spend the money next year to not hunt. Yes. You're basically giving a donation to an organization that gets money from the lottery. Yep. And if that's how you feel, and if that makes you, you happy in Minnesota, great. Because there's no limit on how many tags per each section gets. They say... Everybody hunting in this section can shoot a buck and a doe, but they don't. It, the entire state of Wisconsin can buy a tag for my zone. There's no limit on how many people can hunt here. There's how many. There's a limit on how many deer each person can shoot, but not on how many people can hunt. So in my zone, we have a population of five thousand people. We'll say seventy percent of them hunt or at least by licenses so somebody else can fill them, which party hunting, there's certain rules there, blah, blah, I don't care if you're breaking the law or not, that's up to you. So if we say seven, so if we say we're selling 3,500 tags in our zone to in, in area people, let's bring in another 10,000 people from North Dakota just because we can, right? It's cheap, why not? Well, and, and like we said, I mean, you're basically giving a donation. So next year you don't spend the money you just don't. You still don't shoot a deer. But the next year, you might have something. Yeah. I would be perfectly willing to give up a a year of hunting. 
I'd be perfectly willing. Wouldn't even be a problem. Be like, nope. If I, I if I'm willing to make that sacrifice and this is what I've grown up doing and I love hunting as much as I do, you should be willing to give up that sacrifice. You say, well, I need the meat. Yeah, but if you didn't shoot a deer this year anyway, you What'd still you didn't do? get any meat. Yep. What would you do if you didn't shoot anything this year? Did you go buy a beef? Yeah. Listen, there. if you're going to tell me, not you specifically, but if you're going to tell me that you're hunting to put meat in the freezer – to save money, I'm going to say baloney. You better have a long bow that you made with an arrow that you made. You better be sitting on the f- ground. You better not be in one of your Titan bl- bl- hunting blinds with a heater and your $50, your $50, $500 camo. Like, if you're telling me you need the meat because you can't afford it and you need to just supply for your, or, you know, provide for your family, we're going to get down to the nitty gritty. You better be sitting These in camera, a garden. Uh, you better be sitting on a garden chair on the edge of a field. Yep. Yep. So if you didn't shoot this year, what'd you do for the meat? You probably bought a beef. You had somebody shoot a doe. You got somebody a deer. I've given away so much. I've been privileged. I've, I'm, in, I'm privileged. Two years in a row, I've hunt, shot plenty of deer. I've visited your dad's place. I've been out in Montana. I've harvested enough animals. I've given meat away. And I would happily, because I have a doe tag. I have a private, so I have a buck tag. I could have bought, I bought my rifle license, could have filled that tag, and I had a private doe tag. I can go shoot a doe right now with my bow and hand the deer to somebody. Here, do you need a doe? Do you need it? Now, that person receiving that deer got it for cheap. I spent all the money. But don't tell me you're doing this to save money on 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 beef, on, on, on meat, because... I'll say I'll chew you up and spit you out. So exactly, because it it it, it venison is so expensive. By the time it's all said and done, it's not even funny. It's yep. so expensive. Yep. We're doing it because we love it. Because we love the sport. We love the thrill of the chase. We love the meat. And yeah, we all need to eat the meat if we shoot it or give it away to somebody who wants it. Yep. But we're not doing it just for the meat. And there's very few people who are doing that. And if you're doing it just for the meat, personally, I don't care if you shoot 10 deer and you're supposed to shoot one. If you need the meat that bad, just don't get caught. Why are you waiting for season and spending $40 on a tag? If you need the meat that bad, you're not buying a tag. Right, right. If the times are that hard... And, and you know what? I, I would I'd bat for them. I'd go to bat for them and say they're not, you know, that's that's illegal, but they're feeding their family. So I would bet fairly decent money. There's probably a few people in my area that have done that to feed their family. Yeah, I've actually heard of somebody shooting them in the backyard and feeding their dogs. I'm not sure how I feel about that one, but whatever. I mean... I, you know, dog food's expensive. Mm-hmm. You're feeding them. You're not making anything go to waste. Not that I want you to go blast ten of them, especially if it's by my property. But, uh, eh. Yeah. Eh. Well, if you're that hard up, do what you got to do. Someday, all right. Someday, this world is going to spin off its wheel, and it's going to go down to who's got a gun and who's willing to fight, and who can. Who can survive? Mm-hmm. They make zombie movies every day. They ma- they make post apocalyptic movies every day. It's a guy that can shoot. He's always got a gun. And he knows how to kill. Mm-hmm. At that point, I don't care what you do. You need to learn how to hunt. It is a skill set you need to have. Shoot a firearm. Shoot a bow. Do you? And if and if and when the world comes to that, who cares about licenses? I. I I don't care at all. Right? So, if the world ends, you know where to find us. But YouTube. <laughs> we will no longer be on YouTube if the world ends. <laughs> uh, anyway, so yeah, I think that's going to be the end of this episode. If you think we're wrong, if you think we're crazy, if you think we're got, if we're onto something, let us know. Uh, you can find us on Facebook, YouTube, TikTok, 
bunch of podcast apps, wherever you got podcast apps, iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Anchor. Pick a spot. We are there. We exist just about everywhere. And we are at 10 Point Whitetails, where you can search Lessons of the Woods on your podcast apps. You should find us there. But looking up at looking up 10 Point Whitetails on Facebook and YouTube is two of the easiest ways to find us. If you have any questions for us that don't you don't want in a Facebook message or Facebook comment, you can email us at 10pointwhitetails at gmail.com. Send us an email. We'll try to answer it. We'd love to answer some questions on the podcast if you have any questions for us. I think that's about it at this time. We good to go? Tell us if, tell us if, our, if we're crazy or maybe tell us your plan, what you would want to see if you were a DNR commissioner. Yeah. If you were given the power in a $1.2 billion budget, what would you do? Who knows? So, <laughs> all right. We'll be back next week, Friday at 7 p.m., with another episode of Lessons of the Woods. Thank you, guys. Bye.